Hello, 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 hello. Okay. Hey, we're lucky to have you. We're lucky to have you. All right, you guys get your notes out? Chapter 4, Civil Liberties. Um, at some point in the next couple of days, we're going to look at these and, and develop a, uh, a rubric for them. Probably as we're going through this, I may assign different groups of people certain cases because you're going to obviously notice that we cover a lot of Supreme Court cases in chapters four and five. Okay. So this will probably take two and a half days, maybe. And then, uh, even though I'm not giving you a direct assessment of chapter four, we'll still spend some time in review. Um, I would also say that there's probably a better than decent chance you also will have another article one, section eight quiz this week. Okay. Okay, so who remembers the court case, and this is important, that, that said that the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states? What was it? No. That introductory case that they gave you, which was like a colonial case, you don't need to worry about that. Most of the stuff, again, guys, most of the stuff at the beginning of these chapters, you don't need to worry about. I'm not saying you don't read it, but there's like a page that you don't have to take any notes on. Okay, there's, they're just historical background. I read gone over this case last, last chapter. Barron versus Baltimore, right? And Barron versus Baltimore, right? The Supreme Court said that the Bill of Rights only was applicable to who? Who? The national government. I am, I am always fascinated by the fact that you guys think if you whisper an answer, it makes it less wrong. Right? That's what we think, right? Or you know, another phenomenon, it's weird that the, the way that the, the mind works, you know, you're in your car and you're like, you just need to see differently. Like, I, I'm trying to get over, I'm trying to get over, right? You're not, it has nothing to do with noise whatsoever, and you turn the radio down. Like, that does nothing. It is, it's just, so anyways. All right, so Barron versus Baltimore. So here's the key, is that Barron versus Baltimore happens before the 14th Amendment, all right? After the Civil War, right, we get the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, okay? And though initially, right, the 14th Amendment is viewed as giving former slaves citizenship, okay? If we read it, and the way the court that begins to apply the 14th Amendment is that no state shall deny a citizen equal protection of the law and due process of law. So there are two very important clauses in the 14th Amendment that are going to be more important maybe than anything else we cover in the entire year. Even though the President of the United States wants to do away with birth right, you know, citizenship, you know, because an executive order can obviously, you know, make an amendment unconstitutional. That's a joke. I wonder if my drinky coffee will get picked up on my mic. That's right. Yeah. So this is an experiment. We'll see. I might get, I may get better at this. I'm a little bit self-conscious about, but, um, I do feel like a TED talk, right? And I got—I feel like I need to hold my hands like this, right? You've seen any good TED talk? They stand there like this. How was Cuba? What? You went to Cuba? That's yeah, it was good. All right, moving along. She doesn't want to talk about Cuba. That's fine. So listen. So the Fourteenth Amendment comes along. And says that no state shall deny citizens due process of law. So the court is eventually going to take that to say 
that means that states are going to have to follow what? They're going to have to follow the Bill of Rights. They're going to have to guarantee their citizens due process of law, which includes the Bill of Rights. Okay? That is where we're going to get what becomes known as the incorporation doctrine or selective incorporation. The reason we call it selective incorporation is because on a case-by-case -case basis, it doesn't happen all at once. It's not like the Supreme Court got together someday and waved a magic wand and said, okay, states, now all of a sudden you have to follow the Bill of Rights. That's not the way our judicial system works. That's not the way the checks and balances system works. They had to get a case. A case had to come before them from the states that involved one of the rights in the Bill of Rights, and the courts had to say, no, you violated th this person's due process of law. You can't do that. You have to follow this. Okay? The first one is going to be Gillo versus New York, right? which is a free speech case. And the Supreme Court said, you have to guarantee your citizens freedom of speech. Okay? Yeah, so we're going to get into this more. All right? I'll come back to the selective incorporation again. All right. In Fed 84, okay, what does think Hamilton means when he says, why declare that things shall not be done which there is no power to do? Hamilton was of the mind that we didn't need a Bill of Rights. What was he worried about? What's he saying that the federal government has no power to do? in the Constitution. Popular sovereignty. Yeah. yeah, he's saying, look, the government doesn't have the right. Nowhere does it say that the government has the right to do this. So why do we have to list these rights out? The government doesn't have the power to do this. It doesn't have the power to take away anything like this. The government can only do what we've said it can do. Okay. So he's worried that if we try to list all these things out, that you're actually going to make it worse. Question. Oh, no. I, I feel like it's going to say that. Because then they're like, anyone, they already have it. Yeah, that's why he's, yeah, he's saying, why, why are we doing this, right? And this is all that they can do. You know, we're potentially going to make things worse by saying, well, these are your rights. Okay. All right. So here we go. All right, the 14th Amendment. And on Thursday, we're going to have a 14th Amendment day with some flex groups because of the different parts of the 14th Amendment and how it's, how it's applicable from a civil liberties standpoint and then going forward to a civil rights perspective. When we talk about the difference between civil liberties and civil rights, civil liberties are the rights that individuals are protected, have protected under the Constitution. Okay, those are your civil liberties, your rights that are protected under the Constitution. Civil rights means that you cannot be treated differently because of who you are. You cannot be treated differently because of who you are, because of what race you belong to, because of what gender you are, because of how much money, whatever. Okay. So civil liberties are individual protections of your rights that are protected under the Constitution. Civil rights is that the government cannot treat you differently because of who you are. Okay, So we're focusing on, on the part of the 14th Amendment that we call the Due Process Clause. Okay, So if you get a question that says, what part of the 14th Amendment deals with civil liberties, you're going to say the Due Process Clause. The people are guaranteed right? due process, due process of law. Okay, So <clears throat> there are a couple of different types of due process, right? Procedural due process, which we're a little bit more uh, familiar with, right? Procedural due process is, you know, if you get a charge with a crime, the government has to follow a process, right? They have to read you your rights, right? You have the right to go before a judge, right? You have the right to an attorney, right? Uh, all those things. That's a procedure. That's easy. To, that's easier to understand. That's procedural due process. Substantive due process is a little bit more complicated, right? More kind of a theoretical political science idea. 
is that states have to show that what they're doing is a valid exercise of their power. Are they allowed to do this? Okay. Or does this violate someone's due process protections under the 14th Amendment? Okay. So civil liberties deals with the due process clause, specifically what we call substantive due process. States have to prove that their exercise of power is valid. Okay, be familiar with this term right here. Okay. <clears throat> so, under what clause of the 14th Amendment? The due process clause of the 14th Amendment. All right. States have to protect our freedom of press, speech, assembly, all these things. They have to protect these things. Let me give you this physical example. Think of it like this. All right, we have, and then this is going to be really bad, okay, but we have a, a funnel, okay, and in here is the Bill of Rights, okay, the neck is going to be the 14th Amendment, specifically what part of the 14th Amendment? Due process. And down here, we have this bucket that are the states, right? So, what can come through that neck in a funnel? Everything all at once? No, right? Just a, one at a time, one at a time, right? So, one right at a time can come through down to the states, right? This is the selective part. They're all up here, but they can't all go through the funnel at the same time, right? They can't all go through that neck of that funnel at the same time. They, go, they can go through one at a time, one at a time. That's what we'll talk about, okay? Okay, so... The first case that gets selectively incorporated into the states is going to be what case? What case? Yellow versus New York. Okay. Freedom of speech case. I believe it was 1925. Anybody have the year up in front of them? Okay. So... We're going to talk about a number of these. What I've tried to do is, for our purposes, you can see the cases that I that I bold faced. Those are the ones that you need to know. Okay. So Gitlow versus New York, right? Incorporated speech. Near versus Minnesota, incorporated the press. <coughs> Dijon versus Oregon. Assembly, okay? We're going to skip this religion incorporation case because there are other cases that... All the cases we're going to talk about are not incorporation cases, okay? Um, the right to bear arms, okay, um, is unique because it was actually incorporated twice, right? The first time it was incorporated was D.C. versus Heller, right, where Washington, D.C. had very strict... Um, Handgun law, basically not allowed to own a handgun, purchase handgun within the city limits of Washington, D.C., okay? But D.C. is not a what? And it's not in a state. So is it truly incorporated? Right? So then we get a separate case, right? Uh, McDonald versus the city of Chicago, which is very similar, but Chicago is in a state. So that truly fully incorporated the Second Amendment, okay? 
Uh, still have we have not incorporated the no, no quartering of soldiers. Come down here. We'll talk about the exclusionary rule, All right? Map versus Ohio. That's an important case to know. Okay. Um, Gideon versus Wainwright, which if you don't know what that is by now, you weren't paying attention for the last couple of days. Okay. Now, it's not that these other ones aren't important, um, but I will say that the ones that I boldface for you are the ones that you typically have to know and should know very well. Okay. And those are the one, some of the ones that we'll assign. Okay. All right. So let's talk about <coughs> the First Amendment. There are two clauses within the First Amendment that deal with religion. Okay. The Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Okay. The Establishment Clause says that the government cannot do what? Establish a religion, right? Or, you know, what does that mean? Okay. You know, you can't, government can't favor one religion over another. It can't, um, you know, support a religion financially, right? Lots of different things. Can't establish a religion. Okay. The free exercise clause says that the government cannot do what? Or must allow, can't restrict your practice of religion. Okay. Depending on your perspective in a particular situation, you may believe that a particular issue that comes up really is establishment, or you may believe it's, no, it's really free exercise. Okay, that's why at times it's hard to tell, is it an establishment clause issue or is it a free exercise clause issue? What we have to go on is what did the court say? Okay, what did the court say? For example, okay, if the court were to say that Mr. Shear is not allowed to hold a Bible study for students in his room during lunch, from Mr. Shear's perspective, and if he hired an attorney to defend him, right, because he got fired for doing this or whatever, Mr. Shear may believe that that's what type of an issue? That that's a free exercise issue, right? I am freely exercising my religious right to blah, 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 blah. However, the court's going to look at that situation as Mr. Shearer being a public school teacher and probably make that decision based on what? Establishment clause. Understand how it's, depending on what side of the argument you are on, you could think it's free exercise or you think it's establishment, right? Okay, so keep that in mind as we talk about a couple of these cases. So, prayer in public schools. You guys know the case? From the reading? Yeah, Engel versus Vital. Okay. So, Engel versus Vital, 1962, right? The Supreme Court rules that it is a, it is a violation of the Establishment Clause for public schools to lead their students in prayers. Okay? This is an important case to know. Now, this is not an incorporation case, meaning this. This is not the first time that the court ruled on the Establishment Clause. This just has a very practical uh, or more meaningful meaningful to us because it takes place in a school, right? And a lot of the battleground when it comes to the issue of religion take, does take place in school, right? Public schools, okay? All right, now, does that mean that there can never be a relationship between the government and religion? Is that what it means? Okay, I mean, we have in God we trust on money, right? We say a prayer before Congress starts. They invoke the name of God before the beginning of a Supreme Court session, right? I mean, we have these things in our society, in our government even, that 
are kind of been viewed as custom and tradition, not necessarily supporting religion, right, so on and so forth. Is that the line, though? So let me give you an example. Is it constitutional for St. John's here in town to use Marysville school buses to transport their students to school? Or is that a violation of the Establishment Clause? Are they allowed to use Marysville public school buses to take students to St. John's? What do you think? How many think, no, that's unconstitutional. They should be better do that. That's a religious school. And we need to see, come on, this is participation, right? We're voting tomorrow in this country. You guys should be able to raise your hand. How many think, no, that's fine. Why? Yeah, I mean, what's the purpose of St. John's ultimately, right, is education. Okay, I mean, it's not necessarily religious, I mean, but there's obviously a non-religious reason for it. What if St. John said, hey, Marysville, we would like to, uh, to borrow your buses because we want to take our students to go see um, the Ark. You guys heard of this, right, down in northern Kentucky. Would that be a violation of... The establishment clause. I would still think it would be no, just because that's an artifact. And you don't, again, you don't have to associate it with any like religion or affiliation. It's just an artifact that's not right. Okay. The court would disagree with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I understand your point, what you're saying. It, um, and maybe if I gave another example, it might be a little bit more obvious. But the courts would view that as a religious field trip. And the express biggest purpose of that is a religious experience, right? And, you know, if you know the people that run the ark, it's not, it's not done as a artifact. It's done as a religious belief and so on and so forth, right? So there's, that has a religious purpose. Um, what if the state of Ohio wanted to give out money to schools for new math textbooks? Could the state of Ohio give out money to private schools, Catholic schools, St. John's, to help them buy new math books? Would that be a violation of the Establishment Clause? Doesn't matter. Would that violate the Establishment Clause if they're buying math books? Say, so we need to improve math in the state of Ohio. We need to help all of our students. So we're going to, okay, what if they were going to say, all right, we're going to allow you to buy new Bibles with this money from the state of Ohio. Is that a violation of the Establishment Clause? Yes. Okay. What if the federal government, in order to combat poverty and homelessness, says we're going to give money to local charities, including churches, to provide soup kitchens, food pantries um, for the homeless and the poor and so forth, is that a violation of the Establishment Clause? Okay, now, what if that said organization says, yeah, we'll give you a free meal, but after you sit down and listen to this sermon, Is that a violation of the Establishment Clause? No? You're going to make somebody sit through a religious ceremony in order to get food that's been provided for by... Hello. I have. Hello. Okay. Um... I don't remember. I don't know specifically. I can't remember what actually happened in this case, Lemon versus Kurtzman. But all these scenarios I've been talking to you about, the Supreme Court likes to develop tests for itself, so that when new things happen, they can measure against this test and say, 
is this constitutional or not? Let's be consistent. Okay. So in Lemon versus Kurtzman, the Supreme Court is going to develop what it has become known as the Lemon Test. Okay. So you're going to want to know the Lemon Test. All right. Three things. And this has to do with what can the relationship be between religion and government? When is it okay for the government to interact with religion? And there are three things that the court's going to look at. One, there has to be a legitimate secular purpose. What does secular mean? Not religious. Okay? So I gave you the example of St. John's using Marysville school buses. Is that a legitimate secular purpose to take kids to school? Yeah, education. That's legit. That's not religious. It's education. Okay? The relationship cannot advocate or prohibit a religion. Is Marysville School Bus is going to St. John's advocating that religion? The only way that you could show that it is, is if they said, yeah, you can use it for St. John's, but if there's a Muslim school in town, we're not going to let you use it for that one. Right? So no, that's not really advocating. It's not prohibiting. It's just, right? Here's the tricky one. Is there excessive entanglement? That's the one that's not so easy to figure out sometimes. The example that I gave you, and this is the Bush administration did these policies. Is the federal government writing checks and giving money to religious organizations in order to fight poverty and homelessness and hunger? Does that possibly create excessive entanglement with religion if you might have some religious organizations that are going to say, oh, no, well, yeah, we're going to use this for food, but in order to do that, we want you to read this pamphlet for the first. Or when you come in and get your soup here, you have to have, you know, here, take this, right? Or you have to sit through this sermon. Does that now create a weird arrangement, excessive entanglement? And I'm not saying it does or it doesn't. What I'm saying is, is that this last part of the lemon test is a little bit harder to define, right? These are easier. This is a little bit more subjective, okay? Make sense? Know the lemon test, okay? All right, free exercise clause, okay? Our practice of religion is not absolute. Okay? Are we allowed to sacrifice animals? Are we allowed to sacrifice people? No. Okay? Are you allowed to smoke marijuana in your religious ceremony? Maybe. <laughs> Are you allowed to snort coke in your religious ceremony? Probably not. Okay, so this is what you see. What? Uh, long hits for Jesus, right? Right, or God and snake handling. Is is the, is a state allowed to restrict the practice of religion because of public health and safety concerns? Yes. Here's the trick, though. It often is on a case-by-case -case basis. There isn't a good test, right? Because people are weird. People are going to try to invent all kinds of ways to come up with their new religious ceremonies, right? Well, my religion, you know, you know whatever. I'm not going to go any further. But um, Sorry, all kinds of thoughts, but I'm being recorded, so I won't say them. Um, uh, one, of, one of the standards... Um, is Reynolds versus the United States. This doesn't often come up on, on the test, but this is an example of even this long ago where the Supreme Court stepped in and said, no, this violates the health and safety and morals of a community, and we're not going to permit this. I used to teach this case believing this has to do with polygamy, okay? Having more than one wife, right? And I just kind of joke around about that. I never got that concept because I've been married and I had this, you know, I can't imagine like having more and like it'd be this and then this, this. Okay. But anyways, 
So this has to do with the old Mormon church. Mormon church does not practice this. So they haven't practiced this for years and years and years. Okay? <clears throat> but having more than one wife. I used to believe that the reason that the court ruled against this was more of a legal basis, and I was wrong until I met somebody from Utah who taught me this case. Right? Because there is a, is there a legal benefit to being married? Yeah, right? You get tax breaks, health insurance, all those types of things. So I'm thinking, well, it makes sense that the government's only going to recognize one legal spouse. Okay? However, that's not what this case was based on. Uh, word got back to Washington, D.C., to the courts, that young girls were being forced into these polygamous relationships. Okay? More of a kind of child abuse type situation, if we use our modern language to explain it. Um, you know, 12, 11, 12, 13 year old girls. And the court said, look, that's a clear violation of public safety and health and morals of a community. And we have to do something to protect these girls. This is not a legitimate practice of religion in our society. Okay. So in Reynolds versus the United States, the Supreme Court said polygamous marriages are illegal. They're unconstitutional. They're not supported by the free exercise clause. Now, if you on your own want to live with multiple people that are adults and say that they're your spiritual wife or spiritual spouse, or however you choose to put it, can the court legally step in and stop that? There's been some argument that, yeah, they can. Okay? Um, sister wives is a good example. Okay? They actually like went after that show a little bit with some of the, their spiritual spouses or whatever. Now, that wasn't necessarily challenged in court. Um, so, you know, our free exercise isn't 100% um, absolute, okay? Um, we've restricted some of the practices of, uh, of Muslim inmates that were held like in Guantanamo Bay, okay? some of their practices. Um, however, more recently, there has been this act to try to restore religious freedom in our country in some states. But this has caused some controversy. Can anybody tell me where this Religious Freedom Restoration Act kind of came to a head with a particular issue? Can you, if you own a private business, deny service to someone based on your religious principles because you don't want to make a wedding cake for a gay couple? Based on your First Amendment free exercise clause, we're not going to make this wedding cake for you because in our religion, homosexuality is a sin. We're not... We don't have to serve you. Yeah. So don't. So if you wanted to say like we're not serving you because you're gay, like if they wanted to tell them it's because you're gay, mm -hmm. and they just said we're not going to make the cake for you. you don't like. I want to say like industries, but companies and stuff. They have the right to not serve people like they without reasoning. Yeah, without reasoning. But if they were to not tell them the reason. That's a pretty slippery slope. It would be pretty obvious why, right? I mean, we could talk hypothetically, that might be, you know. And, and, and usually the only time that those types of things apply, it can't, it's, it can't be, be, the reason cannot be, it has to be because you're being disruptive or you're not dressed properly, right? It can't just be, you know, you walk into, you know, my restaurant's at, I don't like you, I'm not serving you, right? Um, that would be pretty hard to pretty hard to do. Uh, um, there was a case over the summer about this. I think it was out of the state of Washington, Oregon. Um, and the court kind of talked out of both sides of its mouth on whether or not this cake shop was allowed to deny an individual, you know, um, because of their belief on homosexuality, right? I mean, it's, for many people, obviously, it's not as cut, cut and dry when it comes to that issue, right? You, many people in this country, you know, don't believe that that's, that you're born that way and don't believe that they believe it's a choice. So therefore it's not the same thing as denying someone 
service because they're black or because they're a woman or whatever, right? Um, so it's not as cut and dry. Is it a religious issue? Is it a civil liberties religious issue? Or is it a civil rights issue of making a distinction and discriminating against a group of people? Okay, it's not, and I'm not giving you the answer. I'm just telling you what the, what the problem is, okay? All right, we good? I know we got some time left, or quite a bit of time left, but I, I only want to do some of these things in chunks. Went through religion, selective incorporation. All right, can somebody explain to me in your own words, in your own words, what is selective incorporation? Come on, somebody give it a shot. In your own words. In your own words. Selective incorporation. What are we incorporating? Right? What are we incorporating? You're close. What are we incorporating? Please excuse the interruption. Attention staff and students, at this time we will be practicing a safety drill for right. the month of November. When we look at safety, one of the things that we have...